In this video, we're going to take a look at section 6.1. So in chapter 6, what we're going to talk about in the end here is exponential and logarithmic functions. So, so far, right, in chapter 3 we talked about functions. Chapter 4 we talked about linear and quadratic functions specifically. Chapter 5 we talked about uh, polynomial and rational functions specifically. In chapter 6, ultimately, we're going to talk about exponential and logarithmic functions. And before we can build our way up to that conversation, there's a couple things we need to discuss first. And one of those is the idea of what it means to compose functions, sometimes called as you know composite functions. So first of all, let's talk about how we would form a composite function. So in the book, they give you a definition. It says two functions, f and g. Uh, we can compose the functions. Right? We can build the composite function, right? f composed with g. And basically what this slide is showing us here is that we have two different notations. So we can use what we call the circle notation to represent composition. And what it really means is uh, procedurally, we're going to take the g of x function and it's going to go get plugged into the f function. All right? Let's take a look at examples of, of what we mean by that. So let's suppose we have the function f of x equals 2x squared plus 3. And we have the function g of x equals 4x cubed plus 1. So let's say letter a, we want to find f composed with g at 1. All right, now there's this inherent order of operations here. So what I'm really going to do first, I'm going to plug the 1 into the g function, and I'm going to evaluate g of 1 first. All right, so again, I'm going to take 1, I'm going to plug it into the g function, and find out what that value is. I get 5 when I do that. So the inside here is really 5. g at 1 is 5. So what I'm going to do then is evaluate f at 5. So now I'm going to take 5, plug it into the f function, and find that y value. And that's going to give me 53. So in the end, we have f composed with g at 1 equaling 53. So I want to point out to you, this is like a two uh, function evaluations embedded inside one problem. The first thing we're going to do, we have an order of operations here. We're going to have g evaluate on 1. We're going to find out what g at 1 is. And then we're going to have f work on that number and then find that value. All right, let's do uh, letter B here. So letter B says take g composed with f at 1. So I suppose we first have to find f at 1. So I'm going to plug 1 into the f function. And that's going to give me 5. And then, <coughs> excuse me, I'm going to take f at 1, which is 5. I'm going to evaluate g at 5. So I'm going to take 5, plug it into the g function, <clears throat> and that's going to give me 501 at the end. So we're going to say that g composed with f at 1 is 501. <clears throat> Excuse me. All right. So I know there's nothing all that exciting here, um, but what we're doing is we're working on a skill. Right? We're working on a skill so that we can ultimately apply this to the ideas of exponential and logarithmic functions. All right, so hang on with me. This is going to get more exciting soon, I promise. All right, so continuing to work on this skill, letter C says we're going to find f composed with f at negative 2. So the first f will operate on negative 2. So I'm going to take a negative 2, plug it into the f function, and I'm going to get 11. And there's a typo here. I'll fix that for you guys. That should be f at negative 2. And here it is written correctly. 2 times negative 2 squared plus 3, which is 11. All right, so now I'm going to take 11. And that's going to get plugged into the second, the outer function, this f. So f at 11 is going to give me 245. And finally, we'll say f composed with f at negative 2 is 245. So last one here, um, we're going to find g composed with g at negative 1. So again, this, this outer g is going to operate on negative 1 first. So we're going to plug negative 1 into the g function. We're going to get negative 3 out of that. And then we're going to take this negative 3, plug it into the outer function. And we're going to get negative 107 when we do that. We're going to say g composed with g at negative 1 is negative 107. All right, so again, nothing all that exciting here, but we're developing a skill that we're going to need very shortly. 
All right, so I'm going to show you something really cool here with the graphing calculator. Not that I need to do this. I mean, all the work that I just did, I definitely could do by hand, all right? But just to show you something kind of cool the calculator can do for me, and we talked about this earlier in Chapter 3. Calculator can evaluate function notation. So what I did was I took the two equations I had, 2x squared plus 3. I plugged that into y1, so that y1 is my f function. And then uh, 4x cubed plus 1 is my g function. I plugged that into y2. So what I can do is I can go to my home screen. Let's say I want to check this first one. I'm going to do f composed of g at 1. So I'm going to do vars. I'm going to hit the vars button here. And I'm going to arrow over to y variables. And I'm going to call out the function named y1. All right, so I got f out here. And then inside, I have g at 1. So I'm going to use parentheses. And I'm going to call out the g function, which was y2 for me. So I'm going to do vars, arrow over to y vars, call out function, in this case, y2. So I'm going to evaluate that at 1. Oops, I need a parenthesis. I'm going to put a parenthesis, evaluate at 1, close the paren, and close the paren. So this is my f composed with g at 1, and that should give me 53 as a result. Right, pretty cool, right? Um, and then I could do the second one, letter B, let's say. So if I was to do vars, y vars, function. I want y2 first, so I'm going to evaluate y2 at y1. So let me go back to vars, y vars, function, y1. I'm going to evaluate that at 1, right? So I'm finding g composed with f at 1 here. So let me do that, and I should get 501. Isn't that cool? Right, that's pretty cool. All right, now if I bring up Desmos real quick, and Desmos, the cool thing about Desmos is I can use the function notation like f of x and g of x, right? So here was the f of x that we had, 2x squared plus 3. Here's the g of x that we had, 4x cubed plus 1. And I can go into the next line, and I can literally just type f composed with g, and then I hit the paren and type 1, and it'll plug in and tell me that value. So I can evaluate the function notation that way, and then it'll tell me what that number is. So kind of cool. Both calculators, right, the web-based calculator, Desmos, and my TI can understand function notation. All right, so the other skill that we're going to develop in this section is finding the domain of a composite function. We've done domain in the past, but we've never done it in terms of, of composing functions together. So let's take a couple examples, uh, look, look at a couple examples. Let's go back to the original f and g that we had. And let's first say we were asked to just compose these two functions. So letter A says find f composed with g. Right. So again, I just want to remind you, right? if we're going to find f composed with g, um, when we do the domain here, the first thing we're going to notice right, is the, the x gets plugged into the g first, and then that gets plugged into the f. So we've got to really consider both values, both functions when we find domain. Right? So g of x must be defined, and then f composed with g must be defined. So we've got to look at both pieces together. Let's, let's see what that looks like. So first of all, when I look at the g of x, I notice that the g of x in general has a domain of all reals. Right? I'm never going to have division by 0 here. I'm never going to have square root of a negative. So g has a domain of our reals. Now we're going to look at f composed with g and see what that looks like. So let's suppose I find f composed with g. So g is 4x cubed plus 1. So I'm going to plug 4x cubed plus 1 into my function f. Right? Now remember what this means is I'm going to take this and I'm going to plug it into the function f. So it's going to go into the x variable here. I'm going to get 2 times this thing squared plus 3. Right? So I'm going to plug it into my function f. Well, so there's my composition. So I do g first and I plug g into f. Now technically I need to simplify all of this stuff, so I should FOIL this out. I should take 4x cubed plus 1 and multiply it to itself, and that's what I would get. And then if I distribute the 2, here's the cleaned up version. So when I look at f composed with g, notice this is a 6th degree polynomial, and it also has a domain of all real. So we're going to say collectively in the end, the domain is all real numbers. Now if we go to the other direction, we do letter b, we do g composed with f, First thing I have to do is consider the domain of f, the inner piece, right? What's the domain of f? And again, f in this case is quadratic. So it has a domain of our reals. Now we're going to compose the two and see what its domain would be. 
So if I do G compose with F, right, so now I'm gonna plug F into G. So here's the equation for F, and it's gonna get plugged into every variable for G. So I'm gonna take this thing here, 2x squared plus 3, and it's gonna get plugged into G's variables. So I'm plugging into G. Now I could cube all of this stuff out, and if I did that, here's the result that I would get, right? And notice that, again, here's a sixth degree polynomial. This domain is all real numbers. And let's look at something that's a little bit more intricate than this. So let's say in this example, we're finding the domain of f composed with g of x. So the first thing we have to do is we have to consider the domain of g. So when I look at the domain of g, I notice I can't have division by 0. So x cannot be equal to 1. So first of all, when I do the domain of the whole composition, I have to eliminate 1 out of the set of real numbers. Can't have that. Now, when I build the composition, when I take g and plug it into f, here's my equation g. So I'm going to plug it into f, right? So right here in f's variable, I'm going to plug the equation g in. Here's me doing that. So now I get to determine what the domain of this expression is. Now the way that I'm going to do this is I'm going to look again at this denominator here, this whole denominator, and I'm going to say, well, this thing right here can't equal negative 2, because if it did equal negative 2, I would have division by 0. I'd have negative 2 plus 2, and that would be division by 0. So I don't want 4 over x minus 1 to equal negative 2. That can't happen. Right? So I'm going to ask, where does that happen? And I'm going to solve that equation. And I'm going to find out that x would equal negative 1. So if x equals negative 1, then I'm going to get division by 0 in my composition. So I can't have x equal positive 1. I can't have x equal negative 1. And so the domain of this composition is all reals except 1 and negative 1. All right, let's do one more example here. I know these are a little bit weird. So let's suppose, uh, let's change our function f and g. So here we have the function f equals 1 over x. Here we have the function g equals root of x minus 1. So if I'm doing letter A, if I'm doing f composed with g first, the first thing I have to do is consider the domain of g. Right? So I'm going to consider the domain of g. So g has a root. So I know the number under the root can't be negative. So I have to make it positive, And that tells me when I add 1 to the other side, x has to be greater than or equal to 1. So initially, here's the domain of g. Now I need to look at the composition f and g together. So if I compose f with g, here's what I get. right? So g gets plugged in. Here's g. It gets plugged into the function f. So I'm going to plug g into the denominator. And here's what I get. Now when I look at this function, again, I can't have division by 0 here. right? So the square root of 0 isn't legitimate anymore, because then I would have division by 0. So when I take the number under the radical, I can't allow it to equal 0, because I would get the square root of 0 in the denominator. So in this case, the domain is x greater than 1. All right, now what we're going to do in this case is between this domain, the domain of g, and this domain, the domain of f composed with g, right, we're going to take the more restrictive domain. Right? So this is basically saying I go from 1 to infinity and I include 1. This is saying I go from 1 to infinity and I don't include 1. Right? This is a smaller domain, so we're going to have to take that smaller domain as the domain of the whole composition altogether. Right? So there's my composition. There's my final domain. All right, now let's look at letter B. So letter B says, let me back up a sec. Letter B says find f composed with f. So I'm going to look at this function first, right? my outer function. Right? Actually, I should say my inner function. This is what gets plugged in first. And I'm going to see this can't have x equals 0, or I would have division by 0. Right? Now we're going to do the composition. Let's do f composed with f. So if I take f and I plug it into f, right? I get 1 over x gets plugged into f. So I get 1 over 1 over x. Right? So I'm plugging 1 over x into the variable for f. So I get 1 over x down here in the denominator. Right? And that's how I'm getting that expression. Now I know in this case that this denominator can't equal 0. 
So I'm gonna say, well, where does that happen? And that's never gonna happen, right? If I multiply both sides by x here, I end up getting one equals zero, and that, that's never true. So I'm never gonna have this piece be divided by zero, right? So this is the only restriction that we're gonna see in this example, all right? Now, let me just show you, I could simplify this expression a little bit, right? Um, this is a compound fraction, and I could flip and multiply my denominator, right? And there's the final form, my simplified form, and there's my final domain that we have there. All right, so the last example we're going to take a look at here um, talks about the idea of uh, what we're going to use actually later in the course. So a little bit later, a couple sections later, we're going to talk about inverse functions. And uh, inverse functions are two functions that undo each other. And so this is kind of what this example is like foreshadowing to. All right. So let's take a look at this function, f. f of x is 3x minus 4. And here's the function g, 1 third times x plus 4. And what this problem is telling me to do is show that when I compose f and g together, and then when I compose g with f, both of these compositions simplify all the way down to just x. Okay, So let's do that work. Let's find f composed with g. So if I do f composed with g, right? g is the equation 1 third times x plus 4. This is going to get plugged into the variables for f. So this is going to get plugged in right here into f. I'm going to take 3 times the plug-in minus 4, right, because I subtract 4 here. And then 3 times 1 third is just 1, and so I get x plus 4 minus 4, which is just x. And we've done the first half of this problem. We have shown that f composed with g equals just x. Right? Now we're going to do the other direction. Let's do g composed with f. So g composed with f, so f is now the inner piece. Right? And here's my f function, 3x minus 4. So that's, that's what we're going to plug into the g function. So I'm going to plug the f into the g function. So this is going to get plugged into that variable right there. I'm going to get 1 third times 3x minus 4, and then the plus 4. All right, now I'm going to simplify inside here first, because I'm going to always do inside parentheses first. Right? So I'm going to do 3x minus 4 plus 4, right, and that becomes 0. Minus 4 plus 4 is 0, so I get 1 third times 3x, and that's just x. So we have shown that this composition simplifies down to x as well. All right, so now again, we're going we're gonna to revisit this concept um, in a couple sections, and we're going to say that when this happens, uh, we're going to call f and g inverses of each other. Now, not all functions simplify this way, but there are some special functions that do, and, and we'll talk about those in more detail soon. All right, one last example here is an application. Uh, so in this problem, it says, suppose that an oil tanker is leaking oil, and we want to be able to determine the area of the circular oil patch around the ship is determined that the oil is leaking from the tanker in such a way that the radius of the oil patch is increasing at a rate of three feet per minute. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna do a composition here. Right? Uh, we're gonna illustrate one uh, advantage to compositions um, that we might see a little bit later in some applications. So first of all, let's remind ourselves that uh, what was given in the problem was that the radius is increasing at three feet per minute. So I could write an equation that describes the radius like as a function of time. So when t is one minute, the radius is three feet. When t is two minutes, the radius is three more feet, which is three times two or six feet. When t is three minutes, I get three times three, which is nine feet. So every minute, my radius increases three feet. I can describe that as an equation, a function. Radius is a function of time as three times t. All right, now, also given in this problem is that the area is leaking in a circular pattern. So we know, you know from prior knowledge that area is a function of the radius. Right? The bigger the radius is, the larger the area I'm going to get out of my circle. Right? The smaller the radius, the smaller the area I'm going to get out of my circle. 
So area is a function of radius, and we could write, you know, a equals pi r squared and think of it in function form. All right, now suppose I wanted to find the area after, you know, one minute, or find the area of the oil spill after two minutes or after three minutes. And what I would have to kind of go through here is a, a kind of like a multi-step process, which is really a composition. So let's say we want to find the area after one minute. Right. So what I would have to do is I have to plug one minute into my radius equation, right, and figure out based on this knowledge here that um, at one minute my radius is three feet. And now that I know my radius is three feet, I could plug that into my area and get three squared times pi, which is nine pi. So my area would be nine pi uh, square feet of area in the circle. So suppose I wanted to find the area after two minutes, or let's say five minutes, actually. Let's jump to five minutes since that's what I picked, right? So if we find the radius after five minutes, right? Five times three gives me 15 feet of radius. And then I plug my 15 into my area function, I get 15 squared, which is 225 times pi. So notice I'm going through this kind of two-step process. I'm plugging into the radius first to determine my radius after you know, five minutes, and then I'm plugging that radius into the area. And this really is a composition, is what we're doing. We're composing the radius into the area function. So let's suppose we want to find the area of the circular oil spill after 10 minutes, right? So after 10 minutes, we know that the radius would be 3 times 10, or 30 feet. And then once I know my radius is 30 feet, I'm going to plug that into my area function and get 900 pi square feet as my area. All right, so again, this is a composition. And in general, after t minutes, I'm going to have a radius of 3t. And when my radius is 3t, I'm going to have an area of you know, pi r squared. So I'm going to have 9t squared pi. And again, this is really a composition, right? I'm taking a and I'm composing it with the radius, right? So I'm doing the radius first. That's getting plugged into the area. And if I do that composition, right, I'm going to get the 9 pi t squared. And that gives me area strictly as a function of time. So the advantage of the composition in this problem is now I, in essence, have eliminated the radius out of my process. That if I'm finding the area after 10 minutes, I can just plug 10 right into my composition formula, and boom, there's the area. Right? So instead of having to take the step of finding the radius first, I'm just plugging the radius into the area, and I'm going to get that already as a function of time. So this is just one example of how you might use uh, compositions and kind of a real world scenario and, and how compositions could be useful. So just a reminder, as you have questions on the homework, please post them and engage me and your peers on the discussion board and I'll see you guys in the next video.